everyone, and welcome to Bend at Night. This is a brand new digital series where we dive into the minds of the developers here at Ben Studio. This year, we're celebrating an incredible milestone of 30 years in the beautiful mountains of Bend, Oregon. Yes, we ski, we hike, and we make games. To get to this point in game development, though, it stems from the team's past and present that continue to create games that impact our players. For Bend at Night, we wanted to spotlight some of those faces each month throughout the rest of this year and provide you with an in-depth look at game development from the professionals behind your favorite games. Each episode will focus on a specific discipline within our studio to learn more about how a game comes together from early development to launch. Our first episode brings us to Environment Art. Hello, gentlemen. How are you doing tonight? Pretty good, Kevin. How are you, man? Good, good, good. How about you, Jonathan? Doing pretty good. Good. Yeah. All right. So we're here to talk about environment art. Jonathan, we'll start with you. What is environment art? Well, I actually haven't thought about that question in a long time. Um, environment art, I'd say, is the process of building a beautiful space that augments gameplay. But I do feel there's a distinction between environment art that's for a game versus your portfolio. You know, if it's environment art for your portfolio, there's an emphasis on like beauty and aesthetics and composition and demonstrating some level of technical acuity. But if it's for a game, you know, it serves a function, so which is to augment the, the play space. I think environment art is like, well, that's extremely broad concept. I always like to think of it as like anything that the player looks at that isn't the player itself. You know, trees and plants and terrain and like flowers, or it can mean like buildings and architecture, you know. But basically anything that you look at uh, in the game space that uh, is seen from the perspective of the uh, player, I think, technically falls within the category of environment art. What are the day-to-day -day responsibilities for an environment artist? For me, I tend to focus on like things like natural landscape features like mountains and cliffs and also things like water, kind of larger features. So I kind of deal with the generation of those assets and the placement of them and making sure they look good and making sure they need to be are, are where they need to be. But it can also kind of be smaller stuff too, you know. I'm sorry, I blanked out. What was the question? <laughs> Your day-to-day. Ah, day-to-day duties. Yes, what are the day-to-day -day responsibilities? I'm involved in so many different facets of production, you know, as you know. So, you know, I do vegetation work. I also work with scan data and systemic foliage placement. So, like, for vegetation, for example, I'm typically, like, gathering references and then breaking down those references into, like, biomes. Then within those references, identifying like what species need to be made to replicate the space. You know, through scanning, I'm able to bring a bit of that reality from our outside world into our game and, and provide some authenticity. It's freaking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> when you mentioned scanning, what exactly does that mean? I don't know. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> now, there's, there are different types of like 3D scanning. There's photogrammetry, which is the process of like, let's say you really like a tree outside and you take photographs of the subject um, and then you're able to use tools to convert that into a mesh, which then you could bring over to the game. And then there's also photometry, which involves using this really awesome rig that uh, where I can capture surfaces like a rug or, you know, wood planks or, you know, uh, some type of forest ground outside and clean it up to be a tellable texture in the game. I use third-party applications to generate these like large-scale assets, which are represented by like a height map. You know, like your your blacks are the lowest, your whites are the highest. Uh, that gets generated into a uh, actual 3D asset, uh, and then you can play. You, you just generate a huge palette of those, and you sort of place them around until you have kind of what you want in terms of the terrain. So, in a studio made up of sometimes hundreds of people, there's a mix of creative ideas. There's uh, different disciplines from animation, programming, artists, community. So what other disciplines do you two work with throughout the studio? If I'm generating these large uh, like terrain assets, I might have to hit up the, um, like the texturing side of things and be like, okay, this is kind of what we, like when we have textures applied to all these things, uh, this is what we kind of want them to look like. And I'm providing the assets, they're providing the textures, you know, so that's, like a pretty clear collaboration there. But then also like things as like small as like audio. It's like how how is it gonna sound when you're running up this mountain? You know, like you have to ask all these questions every time you generate an asset and then the department that you work with really just depends on that, you know? The person I personally work with most is my boy Conrad. He's a, he's a tech artist and typically he helps, you know, me 
sort of develop the tools that are needed to make sure it's an efficient process. And uh, he's pretty awesome. And I also work with programmers in the event. Again, there are other issues that um, that I can't fix on my own. And I work with surfacing artists as well. In, in the event I need tree bark for a tree or landscape materials, um, they're really helpful. And actually even sound and lighting artists when it comes to the, that procedural placement tool because it all you know, is ends up in the same place. Um, so we need to just collaborate to make sure that things are optimized and working as expected. I mean, we do have a pretty cool team here, so there's yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> They're pretty good at their jobs. <laughs> so how does an environment of gray boxes and early development shape up to be that beautiful landscape of rivers and mountains uh, that players get to play, like something like Days Gone? Gray box is just the earliest stage for an environment. So like what you get with that is just the the each like large element just roughly placed so you have a, a general idea of what things are going to look like. Um, then as you progress through different stages of uh, of the scene, uh, things start to get more detailed. Like you start swapping out gray boxes with more detailed assets. You start texturing those assets. You start applying, you know, like surfaces to them. Uh, and then, you know, there's all, you can always like shift things around. Uh, obviously there's no, like not everything's set in stone with gray box. That's kind of the point. You're trying to keep things loose, broad strokes. But yeah, you just sort of get your uh, big strokes down with the, the gray box scene. And then you just sort of iterate until you're, you're down to the finest details. And that's how you end up with these like hyper detailed environments. There are a lot of metrics that are being defined as you're creating gray boxes, right? Um, like for example, as a vegetation artist, some of the things that I'm thinking about is, is the trunk thick enough for the player to, you know, hide and, and use it as cover? Or are the trees, are the tree canopies too small, which is causing, you know, us to use a lot of different trees clustered in one area, which could impede on gameplay. If they're a run away from someone and they want to be in stealth mode, are they recognizing that stealth bush in the distance as an actual stealth bush? Um, so, you know, there are they're definitely metrics that are being defined. Um, and like Ryan was saying, it's just a matter of just replacing the, that block mesh with final assets. And as with all AAA, just iterate until you reach the level of fidelity that the project is uh, aiming for. How do you begin to guide a player from point A to point B throughout a level? Well, I, I got a short answer for that. <laughs> for me, it's pretty easy. I just make trees and shrubs of varying sizes and uh, hand it off to the designer and then they could take <laughs> care of <laughs> pointy <laughs> players. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that is a little more on the design side of things for sure. But I mean, it's, it's much harder with an open world game than it is with a linear game because you need it any random point upon the map to have sort of the map read well to you. So like if there's a large POI that's like sort of central to the space, you kind of want to be able to at least kind of see that from most parts of the map. So you have to keep all of those avenues, those like visual avenues clear at all times so I can see it. So, and it also helps you center yourself. Like if I, if there's one big like POI in the middle of a, of a, of a space, of a large open world space, and I always have that to rely on, I can always look back at it then that means that I can always center myself. I don't always have to rely on like the game map. You don't always have, want to be like bringing up the game map constantly if you can avoid it. So yeah, it's important to keep in mind this sort of sense of of, uh, of location you kind of want to have at all times, you know, but also like invite exploration. The best open world games out there are very detailed and immersive. Mm -hmm. So how do you as an environment artist capture that believability? short answer is to focus on the details that matter to the player. But that's a complex thing because, you know, we all have different thresholds for feeling immersed in something and therefore having that level of believability. Um, I guess from a vegetation artist's perspective, uh, what I need to feel that be believability in the game space, whether I'm playing a game or creating vegetation, what matters to me most and foremost is ensuring that, um, you know, let's, uh, I pretty much capture or I'm able to create an atlas that captures the silhouette of an object, um, as well as the relationship between assets in a way that makes the world feel natural and alive. Everybody has their own kind of, defin like you said, definition of, of what makes right. a game immersive. But for me, when I think of the games, the open world games that I thought were the most immersive, I like to be able to look at a space, both, both in the actual game world or on the game map, and see what's out there, you know, and, mm -hmm. and to feel like I'm drawn out to explore it. And if a game feels, if a game world feels static and repetitive or uninteresting and I don't feel the need to like, you know, 
go out and explore it, that's, I think, you know, that's when, you know, you've kind of failed at that objective. You want to be drawn out to explore and see what's out there and, and, and feel interested in, in, the, in the game world. You want those loud uh, sort of action moments, but you always also want the kind of quieter, more peaceful moments too, to really take things in and absorb the environment for sure. It's important to have that sort of pacing down, I think. Sounds like days going right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would like to think so. <laughs> Creating a world and a game is a lot of work, as you both know. There is, in open world games, there's a lot of trees. There's a lot of bushes. Um, so it's no secret that, you know, game developers have to reuse assets. But how do you know when to reuse those assets to make it still believable to the player, but not a straight-up copy every time? There are a lot of different methods where you can combat art fatigue, you know, like for for my example as a vegetation artist, it's you know tech. It could be texture based, it could be acid based, or shader based. And I'll give you some examples. Um, when I'm thinking about crafting an atlas, let's let's assume I'm making a tree. I'm not just looking at the the growth state of a tree that's just completely mature. You know, I'm looking at the tree as a flower. You know, what's it, what does the sapling look like? You know, and those sorts of things. And then I incorporate all those different growth patterns and silhouettes into the atlas so that I'm able to create many different types of stages for that one asset. So it gives me a lot of reusability with the texture. And there are shader based things you could do as well. So in the event you have seasons in your game, I could, you know, tweak the atlas so that, you know, some may have leaves, some may have flowers, some may feel more lush and, you know, fall colors and so forth. And the shader could sort of swap between those things dynamically. And there's, of course, wind as well. It's a lot more difficult to notice patterns when things are just swaying in the wind. And I think for me, the most important one is asset-based, which when I'm crafting an asset, I'm making sure I'm rotating it like every 90 degrees to ensure it has a, a different silhouette. So that way it's, it maximizes its usage and, you know, just rotating the asset. You're like, oh, that's a different asset. And then you kind of walk around like, wait, is it? I'm not sure. Now it looks completely different as well. So Your eye picks up on repetitives really easily. That's why... And texture work, especially, yeah. you can tell when a texture repeats too many times. You can just your brain picks up on it. So just changing things just a little bit uh, will make things like just kind of fall into place just a little bit better for sure and look less repetitive. It's a big part of of game development. What inspires you to keep creating? How do you kind of continue to evolve your craft as an artist? I freaking love this question. <laughs> yeah, this is good. I'm from. I mean, the most obvious answer is just the games I play. You know, like I still love to play games. I have less free time to do it than when I was a kid. But um, yeah, there's just. I mean, there's more games coming out now than there <laughs> has ever been, and I don't imagine that's going to slow down anytime. So there's um, so much inspiration. I. I'm constantly just filling up my my PS5 hard drive with new, with new games that I can take it take just take it in and just like enjoy the like insanely different takes on development that all the different studios out there have been you know uh, contributing. I am very passionate about a lot of things. I freaking love this question. Um, you know, like it, it, I can get inspiration for so many things. Like it could be a game that I'm playing and I feel so immersed in the environment, the quality of the vegetation for how it was constructed. I could be on a backpacking trip. You know, I'm taking a look at sort of how things are laid out. And then as you're walking a mile, you're like, wait, it's the same assets, but they're distributed differently and the scale changed. And now it looks completely different. I want to make that for our game. You know, or it could be like TED Talks or GDC Talks. It could be a tutorial that I'm watching online or viewing people's art station posts. I mean, it's just... So many awesome things. If you had one thing to say for future artists looking to get into the gaming industry, what would that be? Make connections with people, not even people in the industry, just people that are really, that seem to have a lot of talent. Uh, just make friends because, uh, you know, they're going to make their way in the industry, you're going to make your way in the industry, and just having those ties uh, with people is a big, it, like, it's, it's the, the, the industry is like, seems big, but it's actually pretty insular, and you can sort of figure that out as you work in it, you know? So it's just important to make friends so, like, that you, you know, you always have people to sort of, like, pull inspiration from. It's a fun community, so, you know, you want to be part of it. My advice for people, if you're the most talented person in the universe and you have a crappy attitude, chances are I still wouldn't hire you. Um, and I know a lot of people from different studios who feel the same way. You know, it's, game development is very hard. There's a lot of problems that come up. There's a lot of disputes about how things are, are going to be, you know, should be addressed. So it's important to have someone who's kind and, and showcase, uh, shows empathy on things and just in general brings positivity to the workplace. Thank you both for joining me tonight. 
It was a pleasure. I learned a lot. <laughs> so, uh, I learned a lot too. <laughs> you two are amazing. I'm so glad you're part of Ben Studio. And thank you. Thank you for coming on. That wraps up our very first episode of Bend at Night. Let us know what you think on social media by using hashtag Ben30. We hope to see you next time when we bring on two more developers, this time from the design team. See you soon. Ben Studio out.